Hello Year 6 and welcome to a new day of reading home learning. And at the end of last week we just read up about halfway through our next chapter which is called Flies and Spiders. And all the hobbits and the dwarf had gone into Mirkwood. So let's continue reading and at the end you're going to have a small activity. In the end he poked his head above the roof of leaves and then he found spiders all right. But they were only small ones of ordinary size, and they were after the butterflies. Bilbo's eyes were nearly blinded by the light. He could hear the dwarves shouting up at him from far below, but he could not answer, only hold on and blink. The sun was shining brilliantly, and it was a long while before he could bear it. When he could, he saw all around him a sea of dark green, ruffled here and there by the breeze, and there were hundreds of butterflies. I expect they were a kind of purple emperor, a butterfly that loves the tops of oak woods, but they were not purple at all. There were many dark, dark, velvety black without any markings to be seen. He looked at the black emperors for a long time and enjoyed the feel of the breeze in his hair and on his face. But at length the cries of the dwarves, who were now simply stamping with impatience down below, reminded him of his real business. It was no good. Gaze as much as he might, he could see no end to the trees and leaves in any direction. His heart, that had been lightened by the sight of the sun and the feel of the wind, sank back into his toes. There was no food to go back to down below. Actually, as I have told you, they were not far off the edge of the forest, and if Bilbo had had the sense to see it, the tree that he had climbed, though it was tall in itself, was standing near the bottom of a wide valley so that from its top the tree seemed to swell up all round the edges to a great bowl. He could not expect to see how far the forest lasted. Still, he did not see this, and he climbed down full of despair. He got to the bottom again at last, scratched, hot and miserable, and he could see, not see anything in the gloom below when he got there. His report soon made the others as miserable as he was. The forest goes on for ever and ever and ever in all directions. Whatever shall we do? And what is the use of sending a hobbit, they cried, as if it was his fault. They did not care tuppence about the butterflies, and were only made more angry when he told them of the, be the beautiful breeze, which they were too heavy to climb up and feel. That night they ate their very last scraps and crumbs of food, and next morning when they woke, the first thing they noticed was that they were still gnawingly hungry. And the next thing was that it was raining, and that here and there the drip of it was dropping heavily on the forest floor. That only reminded them that they were parchingly thirsty, without doing anything to relieve them. You cannot quench a terrible thirst by standing under giant oaks and waiting for a small drip, drip to fall on your tongue. The only scrap of comfort there was came unexpectedly from Bumba. He woke up suddenly and sat up scratching his head. He could not make out where he had got to, nor why he was so hungry, for he had forgotten everything that had happened since they started their journey that May morning long ago. The last thing that he remembered was the party at the hobbit's house, and they had great difficulty in making him believe their tale of all the many adventures they had had since. When he heard that there was nothing to eat, he sat down and wept, for he felt very weak and wobbly in his legs. Why ever did I wake up? he cried. I was having such beautiful dreams. I was dreamed I was walking in the forest rather like this one, only lit with torches on the trees and lamps swinging from the branches and fires burning on the ground. And there was a great feast going on, going on for ever. A woodland king was there with a crown of leaves, and there were merry singing, and I could not count or describe the things they were to eat and drink. You need not try, said Thorin. In fact, if you can't talk about something else, you better be silent. We are quite annoyed enough with you as it is. If you hadn't waked up, we should have left you to your idiotic dreams in the forest. You have no joke to carry them on even after weeks of short commons. There was nothing now to be done but to tighten the belts round their empty stomachs and hoist their empty sacks and packs and trudge along the track without any great hope of ever getting to the end before they lay down and died of starvation. This they did all that day, going very slowly and warily, while Bomber kept on wailing that his legs would not carry him and that he wanted to lie down and sleep. No, you don't, they said. Let your legs take their share. We've carried you far enough. All the same, he suddenly refused to go a step further and flung himself on the ground. Go on if you must, he said. 
I'm just going to lie here and sleep and dream of food. If I can't get it any other way, I hope I never wake up again. At that very moment, Barlin, who was a little way ahead, called out, What was that? I thought I saw a twinkle of light in the forest. They all looked, and a longish way off it seemed they saw a red twinkle in the dark. Then another and another sprang out beside it. Even Bomber got up, and they hurried along then, not caring if it was trolls or goblins. The light was in front of them and to the left of the path, and when at last they had drawn level with it, it seemed plain that torches and fires were burning under the trees, but a good way off their track. It looked as if my dreams were coming true, gasped Bomber, puffing up behind. He wanted to rush straight off into the wood after the lights, but the others remembered only too well the warnings of the wizard and of Bjorn. A feast would be no good if we never got back alive from it, said Thorin. But without a feast we shan't remain alive much longer anyway, said Bomber, and Bilbo heartily agreed with him. They argued about it backwards and forwards for a while, until they agreed at length to send out a couple of spies, to creep near the lights and find out more about them. But then they could not agree on who was to be sent. No one seemed anxious to run the chance of being lost and never finding his friends again. In the end, in spite of warnings, hunger decided for them, because Bumba kept on describing all the good things that were being eaten, according to his dream, in the woodland feast. So they all left the path and plunged into the forest together. After a good deal of creeping and crawling, they peered round the trunks and looked into a clearing where some trees had been felled and the ground levelled. There were many people there, elvish-looking folk, all dressed in green and brown and sitting on some sawn rings of the felled trees in a great circle. There was a fire in their mist, and there were torches fastened to some of the trees round about, but most splendid of all, they were eating and drinking and laughing merrily. The smell of the roast meats was so enchanting that, Without waiting to consult one another, every one of them got up and scrambled forwards into the ring with the one idea of begging for some soon food. No sooner had the first stepped into a cling than all the lights went out as if by magic. Somebody kicked the fire and it went up in rockets of glittering sparks and vanished. They were lost in a completely lightness dark and they could not find one another, not for a long time at any rate. After blundering frantically in the gloom, falling over logs, bumping crash into trees and shouting and calling till they must have waked everything in the forest for miles. At last they managed to gather themselves in a bundle and count themselves by touch. By that time they had, of course, quite forgotten in what direction the path lay and they were many and they were all hopelessly lost, at least till morning. There was nothing for it but to settle down for the night where they were. They did not dare even dare to search on the ground for scraps of food for fear of becoming separated again. But they had not been lying long, and Bilbo was all only just getting drowsy, when Dory, whose turn it was to watch first, said in a loud whisper, The lights are coming out again over there, and there are more than ever of them. Up they all jumped. There, sure enough, not far away were scores of twinkling lights, and they heard the voices and laughter quite plainly. They crept slowly forwards to get towards them, in a single line, each touching the back of the one in front. When they got near, Thorin said, No rushing forward this time. No one is to stir from hiding till I say. I shall send Mr Baggins alone first to talk to them. They won't be frightened of him. What about me of them? thought Bilbo. And anyway, I hope they won't do anything nasty to him. When they got to the edge of the circle of lights, they pushed Bilbo suddenly from behind. Before he had time to slip on his ring, he stumbled forward into the full blaze of the fire and the torches. It was no good. Out went all the lights again, and complete darkness fell. If it had been difficult collecting themselves before, it was far worse this time, and they simply could not find the Hobbit. Every time they counted themselves, it only made thirteen. They shouted and called, Bilbo Baggins, Hobbit, you dratted Hobbit, hi, Hobbit, confusticate you, where are you, and other things of that sort, but there was no answer. They were just giving up hope when Dory stumbled across him by sheer luck. In the dark, he fell over what he thought was a log, and he found it was the hobbit curled up fast asleep. It took a deal of shaking to wake him, and when he was awake, he was not pleased at all. I was having such a lovely dream, he grumbled, all about a most gorgeous dinner. Good heavens, he's gone like Bomber, they said. Don't tell us about dreams. Dream dinners aren't any good, and we can't share them. They are best I am likely to get in this beastly place, he muttered, as he lay down beside the dwarves and tried to go back to sleep and find his dream again. 
but that was not the last of the lights in the forest. Later, when the night must have been getting old, Killy, who was watching them, came and roused them all again, saying, There's a regular blaze of light begun not far away. Hundreds of torches and many fires must have been lit suddenly and by magic, and hark to the singing and the harps. After lying and listening for a while, they found they could not resist the desire to go nearer and try once more to get hope. Up they got again, and this time the result was disastrous. The feast that they now saw was greater and more magnificent than before, and at the head of a long line of feasters sat a woodland king with a crown of leaves upon his golden hair, very much as Bomber had described the figure in his dream. The elvish folk were passing bowls from hand to hand and across the fires, and some were harping and many were singing. Their gleaming hair was twined with flowers, green and white gems glinted on their collars, and their belts and their faces and their songs were filled with mirth. Loud and clear and fair were those songs, and out stepped Thorin in their midst. Dead silence fell in the middle of a word. One went all light. The fires leaped up in black smokes. Ashes and cinders were in the eyes of the dwarves, and the wood was filled again with their clamour and their cries. Bilbo found himself running round and round, as he thought, and calling and calling. Dory, Nori, Ori, Oin, Gloin, Philly, Killy, Bomber, Biffa, Boffa, Dwalin, Barlin, Thorin, Oakenshield. While people could not see or feel were, were, were doing the same all around him, with an occasional Bilbo thrown in. But the cries of the others got steadily further and fainter, and though after a while it seemed to him they changed to yells and cries to help in the far distance, all noise at last died right away, and he was left alone in complete silence and darkness. That was one of his most miserable moments. But he soon made up his mind that it was no good trying to do anything till day came with some little light, and quite useless to go blundering about tiring himself out with no hope of any breakfast to revive him. So he sat himself down from his back to a tree, and not for the last time fell to thinking of his far distant hobbit hole with its beautiful pantries. He was deep in thoughts of bacon and eggs and toast and butter when he felt something t touch him, something like a strong sticky string was against his left hand, and when he tried to move, he found that his legs were already wrapped in the same stuff, so that when he got up, he fell over. Then the great spider, who had been busy tying him up while he dozed, came from behind him and came at him. He could only see the thing's eyes, but he could feel its horrible hairy legs as it struggled to wind its abominable threads round and round him. It was lucky that he had come to his senses in time. Soon he would not have been able to move at all, as it was, he had a desperate fight before he got flee. He beat the creature off with its hands. It was trying to poison him to keep him quiet, as small spiders do to flies, until he remembered his sword and drew it out. Then the spider jumped back, and he had time to cut his legs lo loose. After that, it was his turn to attack. The spider evidently was not used to things that carried such stings at their sides, or would have hurried away quicker. Bilbo came at it before it could disappear, and struck it with his sword right in the eyes. Then it went mad and leaped and danced and flung out its legs in horrible jerks until he killed it with another stroke and then he fell down and remembered nothing more for a long while. There was a usual dim grey light of the forest day about him and when he came to his senses the spider lay dead beside him and his saw's blade was stained black. Somehow the killing of the giant spider all alone by himself in the dark without the help of the wizard or the dwarves or anyone else made a great difference to Mr Baggins. He felt a different person, and much fiercer and bolder in spite of an empty stomach as he wiped his sword on the grass and put it back in its sheath. I will give you a name, he said to it, and I shall call you Sting. After that he set out to explore. The forest was grim and silent, but obviously he had first of all to look for his friends, who were not likely to be very far off, unless they had been made prisoners by the elves or worse things. Bilbo felt that it was unsafe to shout, and he stood a long while wondering in what direction the path lay, and in what direction he could go first to look for the dwarves. Oh, why did we not remember Bjorn's advice and Gandalf's? he lamented. What a mess we're in now! We! I only wish it was we! It's a horrible being on your own! In the end, he made as good a guess as he could in the direction of which the cries for help had come in the night, and by luck, he was born with a good share of it. He guessed more or less right, as you will see. Having made up his mind, he crept along as cleverly as he could. Hobbits are clever as quietness, especially in woods, as I have already told you. 
Also, Bilbo had slipped on his ring before he started. That is why the spiders neither saw nor heard him coming. He had picked his way stealthily for some distance when he noticed a place of dense black shadow ahead of him, black even for that forest, like a patch of midnight that had never been cleared away. As he drew nearer, he saw that it was made by spiders' webs, one behind and over the tangled with another. Suddenly he saw too that there were spiders huge and horrible sitting in the branches above him, and ring or no ring, he trembled with fear lest they should discover him. Standing behind a tree, he watched a group of them for some time, and then in the silence and stillness of the wood, he realised that these loathsome creatures were speaking to one another. Their voices were a sort of thin and creaking and hissing, but he could not make but he could make out many of the words that they said. They were talking about the dwarves. It was a sharp struggle, but worth it, said one. What nasty thick stings they have to be sure. But I'll wager there's a good juice inside. Aye, they'll make fine eating when they've hung a bit, said another. Don't hang them too long, said a third. They're not as fat as they might be. Been feeding none too well of late, I should guess. Kill them, I say, hissed the fourth. Kill them now and hang them dead for a while. They're dead now, I'll warrant, said the first. That they are. Saw one stropling just now. Just coming round again, I should say, after a beautiful sleep. I'll show you. With that, one of the fat spiders began, ran along a rope till it came to a dozen bundles hanging in the row from a high branch. Bill Boy was horrified. Now that he noticed them for the first time dangling in the shadows, to see a dwarfish foot stick out of the bottoms of some of the bundles, or here and there the tip of a nose, or a bit of beard, or of a hood. To the fattest of these bundles, the spider went. It's old poor Bomber, I'll bet, thought Bilbo, and nipped hard at the nose that stuck out. There was a muffled yelp inside, and a toe shot up and kicked the spider straight and hard. There was life in Bomber still. There was a noise like the kicking of a flabby football, and the enraged spider fell off the branch, only catching itself with its thread just in time. The others laughed. You're quite right, they said. The meat's alive and kicking. I'll soon put an end to that, hissed the angry spider, climbing back onto the branch. And we're going to stop there. And here you can see the spider and all the dwarves covered in spider's webs. They've obviously been caught by these really nasty creatures. And now comes on to our task. What I want you to do is I want you to make a prediction. I want you to go into your lined books and make a prediction of what you think is going to happen next. What's going to happen with the dwarves and the spiders. And what do you think Bilbo might do because he's the one who's free. And if he is going to save them, how? Why? When? So let's all make a really quite detailed prediction about what's going to happen next into your lined books. Good luck, and I really look forward to reading your predictions.